Good morning, everybody. Brent Jeffries, Vice President of Field Operations, Safety Trainer with Beer Meters. Been with Beer Meters for going close to 10 years now. And um, so for about seven years, I've been doing around the country, nationwide, little a little international travel, lineman safety and tool training. So today you're gonna get lineman safety and tool training, what we've been sharing. Beer Meters, as you all know, we're a manufacturer of phasing tools uh, cable ID tools, phasing, phasing meters. Um, we've been in manufacturing these tools for uh, 37 years and our products for about 37 years. Uh, Walter Beer, my stepdad, who I call my dad, he's raised me since I was about five years old. He owns the company and uh, has 17 patents. So it's pretty unique, it's pretty cool to be working here with the family. My brother, I've got my nephew, wives, uncles, we got a great, awesome team here in South Carolina, and we happen to be actually in our live line training center today, and we're gonna be looking at getting a big old cover put over here, some more equipment, so you all can come in here and, and use it for no cost. And this is gonna be called, uh, this is part of ECOS, what we started just oh, about a year and a half ago, uh, Electric Culture of Safety. This is gonna be Lineman Safety National Webinar 028. Um, lineman safety and tool training is what it's going to be called and uh, so as of right now we have about 25 uh, full-length videos recordings that you all can get uh, from ECOS if you if you uh, register all you need to do is go to safety training at beermeters.com I'll get you registered I'll send you whatever videos you want if you want all of them that's fine there's no there's no cost to ECOS at all we just, this last week, we just had Billy Martin come in and he spoke an awesome, awesome speech on moving from human behavior into human potential. That was wonderful. That's a must have. That, uh, th that speech alone is probably one of the very largest cogs of this beautiful timepiece that we call electrical utility industry that is actually missing in this timepiece. It's missing. So the, in other words, the timepiece is not functioning properly because it's lacking human potential. All right. Then we had uh, yesterday, we had Mr. Christopher Jesse with Bird Electric come in and he gave us a, a great presentation, another must have, and it was called Blending the Generations. I, I, there were so many things that I just like, whoa, I was just ignorant of. And I've got to go back over that too more hit repeat and play over replay now next next month we got mark forrester with he's uh, affiliated with ip uh, i ispc institute for safety and and power line construction he'll be speaking next week and then miss emily wilkins with austin energy she's going to be speaking not next week next month she'll be speaking as well in august 15th and then emily will be coming august 16th now, what's neat about these things is, is these folks, their companies sponsor this. Their companies fly them out to South Carolina to our Liveline Training Center. They pay for it. Beer, we pay for having this facility. We pay for the recording. And everybody that's a part of ECOS, Electric Culture Safety, now 8,500 members plus. Everybody gets this training. The best of the very best. The best training, all these different subjects, topics, for nothing that's awesome so what we're doing is we're forming a line team that's what we're calling this a line team okay so real quick we're going to jump into some of this what we do is i'm going to read a where is it i'm going to read a poem i've been reading this poem throughout the country when i do training uh, i started reading this in california uh, back in february in california to those folks and I want to read you guys this poem and this poem was written by uh, Don Merrill and this it was written about several decades ago two three decades ago um, and anyways it's called I chose to look the other way and this poem is super important to listen to listen to these words and just think about what's being said here in the amount of red flags that you hear the 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 in between these words it should these words should cause you to pause they could they should cause you to really 
look inside yourself. This is so important, folks. This is what's going on, and it's still going on. We're having a fatality almost weekly, and it's because of what's going on in this poem. It's very honest. It's very brutal and raw. Listen to what is being said here. It's called, I Chose to Look the Other Way by Dom Merrill. I could have saved a life that day, but I chose to look the other way. It wasn't that I didn't care. I had the time and I was there. But I didn't want to seem a fool or argue over a safety rule. I knew he'd done the job before. If I spoke up, he might get sore. The chances didn't seem that bad. I'd done the same. He knew I had. So I shook my head and walked by. He knew the risk as well as I. He took the chance. I closed an eye. And with that act, I let him die. I could have saved a life that day, but I chose to look the other way. Now every time I see his wife, I know I should have saved his life. That guilt is something I must bear, but isn't something you need to share. If you see a risk that others take that puts their health or life at stake, the question asked or thing you say could help them live another day. You guys hear that poem? I'm telling you guys, this is so serious. That poem was written so many decades ago, and in 2004, OSHA came and they, they, they created what it was called a TD partnership, T and D partnership. And what they did is they took over 500 incidences of fatalities that have taken place within line work in 2004. And when they looked at these documents of fatalities, the truth of the matter was, is that they, these fatalities did not take place because of a lack of PPE. The fatalities did not take place because of a lack of safety, a lack of training. Nope. These fatalities were choices. Whether these choices were made consciously or unconsciously, ignorantly or, or totally aware, these choices were made and the deaths take place. It's all right here, folks. This is where it's at, right here, okay? So we're gonna talk about psychological safety. We're gonna talk about some technical safety and, and, and training and proper body position, improper body position, proper tool position, improper tool position. We're gonna talk about your electrical reality. And your, this is not electrical theory. This is your electrical reality. This is what we do, this is where we work. It's a field. And a lot of this field, we see, all, we see this equipment that's in front of us, different, different pieces here. We got some underground, we got some overhead, we got some high voltage, we got a little low voltage, we have some induction. All these things are happening with this equipment. We can't see, but we gotta be aware of what's happening in our environment. This is where we work, okay? We gotta stay aware, situational awareness. And a lot of the situational awareness that we're lacking is we're not staying aware of what's going on inside our brains. Y'all get that? Together, connecting together. This is so important. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is gonna be your grounds, your TPGs. Mr. Brady Hansen calls, calls OSHA 1910.269. He calls these regulations, these rules, he calls them the uh, scriptures for linemen. These here, were written because somebody died. Somebody didn't go home, somebody lost a body part. It's happening, true thing, and it's still happening. And see how thick this book is? See how thick? I guarantee you, in the next few years, this book will start getting even thicker. More rules, more regulations. And what we need to do is we need to look at these rules, we need to look at these guidelines, these regulations, simply as a foundation for our safety. See this book? This is a foundation for our safety. And what we must do is we must take this foundation and we must be responsible. Our utility, our contracting, the company we work with, some contractor, we must be responsible to take that foundation and what we're gonna do is we're gonna enhance it. We're gonna create this foundation to be living, to be alive. And we're gonna build walls. We're gonna to add to this walls. 
and we're going to make a roof. We're going to put a roof over this rules and regulations. And this roof is where we're going to reside. This is where we're going to have our being as line workers. This is where we're going to be inside this home. And this home is going to protect us from the elements. This home that we're going to live in is going to protect us from pride. This home that we're going to work in is going to protect us from complacency. This home is going to protect us that we're going to live in and reside in. It's going to protect us from ourself. Because what happens is when you start focusing on yourself and not team, somebody gets hurt. A mother loses the father, the kids, no more dad, no more husband. Okay? So this is what's going on. we got to watch out for each other, and we got to be inside this home in our utility, our contracting company. we got to reside in this home together. It's not a one-bedroom house, folks. All right? It's not a one-bedroom house. It's all together, all of us. You all get that? Okay? Team, line team. Now, in the ocean regs in 1910.269, if you go to lowercase n, Lowercase n is about your temporary protective grounds. We're going to call your temporary protective grounds your best friend. Okay, we're going to talk about two best friends today. Your temporary protective grounds is one of your best friends. And therefore, you need to take care of, you need to maintain that relationship, right? You need to watch over your best friend. So these regs and in, in, in lowercase n, if you go to number four, Number four talks about how the ASTM 1048 and the, and the uh, I'm sorry, the ASTM F855 uh, brings in into the guidelines as, into the OSHA regs, apologies, as guidelines. And also the uh, IEEE 1048, they're in the regs as guidelines. And in those guidelines, you'll read that you are to maintain, you're to watch over. So what you're gonna do is, is you're going to verify your TPGs. You're going to verify that you're, you're going to look at your cable. You're going to make sure that there is no pinched cable. There's no smashed cable. That there's, there's no, if you can see your strands, that you don't see broken strands. You're going to also make sure that you don't see any blackened copper. And you don't see any oxidization on your components. This looks pretty clean. You're not going to, especially on your contact points. Especially, you don't want to see, obviously, loose components, any cracks on your clamps at all. Um, so you're going you're gonna to just give a visual inspection. You're also going to do a mechanical inspection. The mechanical inspection, you're going to grab a hold of that ferrule and make sure that that ferrule is nice and tight, that the crimps are nice and tight on that cable, that you don't got any wobbling going on inside that ferrule. Make sure it's nice and tight. You're also gonna make sure that your ferrule is tight in the clamp itself. It's, it's very important. So you're gonna do a visual, you're gonna perform a mechanical inspection. You gotta take care of your best friend. After seven years of going across this country, some into Canada, there, are, there were utilities where I would arrive and start speaking on the visual inspection the mechanical inspection, and they didn't know anything I was talking about. And the reason why they didn't know is because they weren't trained. Nobody had trained them to take care of their best friend. No one had even trained them that your TPGs are a best friend. They didn't know. They just took it for granted. These things, these things were sitting in line trucks, out in the weather, not, to, not in a nice little bag, out of the weather being taken care of. They weren't being taken care of at all. They were abused. How do you abuse a best friend? Your best friend, if you abuse a best friend, ain't going to be your best friend for long. You see how that happens? Okay? Take care of your best friend. So, in these infractions that we don't want to see, I have seen not just one, but I've seen multiple infractions on one particular assembly at different locations. But the good news is that tens of thousands of linemen are safer today than they were before we showed up. Okay, so this is what's important. This is why we're doing these nationwide videos. This is why we formed ECAUSE, because we can't get everywhere. 
So you guys need to take these and share them. Okay? So here we go. Then it also talks about in those guidelines that are within the OSHA regs that you're also going to be performing an electrical test. Think about that. The guidelines are in the regs. You know there are still utilities, contractors today that do not electrically test. Think about this. They're TPGs for their linemen, for their line ladies. They don't test them. That's insane. And the regs say that they're responsible to verify that the TPGs can take that potential fault current on that particular area within their circuit. Hmm? Think about it. So we're gonna do an electrical test. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that the cable's in parallel. So we're gonna mimic the situation to where you're applying these TPGs to your system, you're setting up your, your equal potential zone, that you're gonna be going from point A conductor to point B ground or whatever, okay? You're setting this up from point A to point B, more or less in a straight line. Yeah, you're gonna have some droopage, but more or less in a straight line. So when you test them, you do not want to have any coils in your TPGs when you're testing. They need to be parallel, because that mimics, that mitigates that, that magnetic field, mitigates it. Therefore, you're mitigating thermal activity. Therefore, you're allowing your TPGs, your best friend, to work more efficient, all right? They'll protect you much better. So we're gonna go ahead and create a parallel situation, and we're gonna crank this variac here. It requires, this chart here requires 165 amps. So we're gonna go, here's our amp meter. Can you get that, Ben? You see it? You're good? We're gonna go to 165. And it's hot out here. You don't wanna do this out in the sun. So we're, our number is gonna be a little skewed and not accurate. A little high, because it's, it's warm out here in the South Carolina sun, okay? And we've got a 0.264 voltage drop. The chart says 0.24 less. This does not pass. It doesn't pass, but obviously if we were in the shade, it would be a lot cooler, more efficient. It would pass, and it does when I'm traveling around the country on a regular basis, because usually I'm not out here in the sun, okay? So the test is over, and what we're going to do is, is we're going to form a coil. I was doing training at a contractor, uh, with a contractor in North Carolina a couple of years ago, and one of the linemen, they did a lot of transmission work, one of the linemen said, hey, when I'm on 69, my assembly is a little long, because usually we're maybe 230 or 345, but my assembly's a little long, so because it's a little long, I go ahead and I coil it up, get some electrical tape, make it look all pretty, and I make a coil. So it looks nice hanging on the line. And you're telling me that you can't do that. That's what he's telling. You're telling me, no, I'm not saying it. The magnetic field tells you, all right? So let's just take a gander. We're gonna crank this up to about 300 amps. You see that, Mr. Ben? 300 amps. Here's a magnet, and you all see that right there? Okay, that's your magnetic, that's your electrical reality right there, huh? Now watch this, let's go parallel. Let's go parallel. The same current, and let's go to that field right there. You see it's just humming, it's, it's smooth. You see that? So always keep your, your, your P, TPGs in a straight line. If, if they're on a truck reel, if they're on a truck wheel, reel and you're using them on a truck reel, make sure you get those things off that reel, place them on the ground, and you're gonna put the, those, the, the cable in parallel with itself on that truck on the ground from the truck reel, okay? To mitigate that magnetic field, you're gonna do that. Have you all seen a, a YouTube video uh, with, with uh, a potential fault current that hits? A, a fault current that does hit a grounding assembly that's on the truck reel, what happens to it? What happens is it explodes the truck reel because that cable is trying to escape from itself. All right? And if you're in the way, if that coiled assembly is close by you, maybe it's next to you in the bucket, and that fault current hits and you're in the way, what could happen? Just think about it. 
okay? Also, you need to remember that when you're working together as a team, whenever you're working together as a team, you don't want to come to each other on your crew as a team all coiled up. You want to come together in parallel, in sync, okay? Neurosynchronicity, right here. Don't be all coiled up with one each other because then something's going to happen. All right, remember that poem we read? Huh? Not a lot of teamwork in that poem, was there? All right? All right. So what we're going to talk about is meters. These, these, this, this training is non-biased. It doesn't matter if you use our tools or use anybody else's tools. How these tools function is exactly the same. All right? The functionality is exactly the same, and here's what you're going to do. Whether it's a push button or whether it's a, a face plate like ours happens to be, you're always going to perform a battery test. Always remember that the battery test is simply a battery test. It does not test your tool, whosoever it is, on a live known voltage source. It's simply testing your battery. Our battery test goes through about 90% of the electronics and the mechanisms inside your tool, but you cannot rely on it as a true tool functionality test. Okay? So horn and light, if you ever use horns and light, Obviously, you're going to see in here. If you do not see in here, what you're going to do is you're going to simply take off the quick change right here, access the 9 volt battery, change out the 9 volt battery, knowing that you use a good 9 volt battery, retest. If after you retest, you don't see or don't hear or both, the tool's broken, tag it, send it in for repair. We repair all of our tools, we have a great repair facility and it's quick. Let's just get it repaired. Get it back to you. In analog, it's real simple. In analog, a battery test push button or faceplate switch, you're simply going to look for that needle to deflect hard all the way. Y'all see that? Okay. If you don't see that needle deflect hard all the way, maybe it's partial or doesn't move, change out the battery. If you still don't, tag it, send it in for repair. After the batteries change, send them for repair. I can't tell you how many tools we get in that all we do to repair them is we replace the battery. Okay? It's just expense out of your pocket. Train your guys, train your gals, train your line team. Do a battery test. A digital, is, I like digitals. They're my favorite. And the reason why they're my favorite is because digitals, I believe, are safer. They give you more information. If I have a crew out on the line, I want my crew to have the maximum information possible using the safest equipment. So I prefer digital. Regardless of manufacturer, I like digital. One, the digitals don't have moving parts, okay? Analogs, if you drop them a lot, kind of clumsy, you know, maybe you're a little tired that day, you trip over a little roly-poly rock going out to the job site from, from your vehicle and you, you fall down, whatever, some trip hazards, right? And you drop your, your analog a few times. It can mess it up, the springs, it can mess up the levers, it can mess up the calibration a lot easier than a digital, no moving parts, all right? Now the digital, when you do a battery test, it actually gives you the battery voltage. Remember, we talked about more information. Well, this is proof. We're actually gonna see the battery voltage. Here we go, about 8.5. Okay, more information. So right there, that already proves that point. Here we go. So care, tool care, hot stick wipes. Keep your tools clean, especially the probe. You don't want to have any grease, any dirt uh, on that probe. That keeps the, the outside from having a, a flashover tracking on the outside of the probe. Inside the probe, we have resistors. The resistors that are placed in here are, are encapsulated in epoxy and that epoxy keeps inside tracking from taking place. All right, so they're very safe. Some, you, some manufacturers do not put any epoxy or nothing inside their probes. If you get a hacksaw, cut it open, you can see the proof. Hacksaw ours, you see the proof. So ours keeps 
internal tracking from taking place. And because they're encapsulating, it encapsulates the resistors and it keeps the resistors from coming loose inadvertently traveling down the road in these bumpy trucks, okay? So keep no calibration stickers on the outside. If you've got to mark your, your vehicle number or your crew, your truck number, whatever on your tool, calibration stickers, make sure they're on the housing. Make sure they're on the housing. The resistors are about where that line limit is, two and a half inches down. Always remember that line limit. It's gonna remind you where the resistors are. And those resistors are what helps protect you, work in the tool, and protect the tool itself. Always remember that. The idea is not to bypass that line limit with a potential ground plane, nor another hot phase. And what you're all gonna do is you're gonna create in your mind a sphere. And that sphere you're gonna create is gonna go from that line limit, it's gonna go around the tool, behind the tool, it's gonna go underneath the tool, and it's gonna go over the tool. And that is gonna be a confirmed air gap. We're gonna call her your air dielectric. Your air dielectric, we're gonna call her your other best friend. She's the second best friend we're gonna talk about today. Air dielectric, okay? Y'all get that? So if you, have, if you inspect your area and you see that the cabinet's really tight, maybe you're on a feed through and that cabinet's super tight. If your hand inadvertently slips while you're holding the stick and that tool comes in contact, maybe with a ground plane or maybe there's a bleed wire, static wire, it comes in contact or very close proximity to that static wire, you could have a flashover. We get those calls. We used to get them a lot. We don't get them hardly any at all anymore because linemen are being taught how to use their tools properly. So it's working. It's working. So keep your air dielectric, okay? Now here's how the tools function. We're gonna talk about tool functionality. When you all were in school, you learned some math. Some math that you learned didn't do too much for you nowadays. But some math you learn does great. A little addition, a little subtraction, maybe some division, multiplication, the basics, right? Well, this is math that you're gonna to have to always know, this equation, you always wanna know. And this is, a, this is an equation, a math equation, that you, as a line worker out in the field, must always remember, and you're gonna share it from time to time because you're gonna see things out in the field that are dangerous. You're gonna see things out in the field that aren't too good. They're, they're sketchy. You're gonna get in that gut feeling and say, man, this just doesn't look right. So, you know, if you see something, say something. And if you don't understand or they don't understand, you've gotta give them the reason why. Explain the why behind everything that you guys are involved with. Everything that you're gonna to touch, everything you're gonna move. You're gonna switch out everything. Where you, where you park the truck, your cones. You're gonna talk about everything. These job briefings, if you ever go over these job briefings, after you do a job brief, why don't you guys practice once in a while when you're done with the job brief to go over the job brief. Allow your apprentice to talk about the job brief after the job brief, huh? Do a job brief briefing. What do you think about that? Let the apprentice practice speaking up, practice giving his input. Do a two minute walk around the job, looking at all the equipment, high, the lows, the in-betweens, huh? Maybe there's somebody that's, that looks really sleepy on the crew that day. Maybe somebody on the crew smells like alcohol. Hmm? That's not good either. You gotta be fit for duty, folks. Fit for duty. So we're gonna, we're gonna brief the job brief from time to time. So what you're gonna do is, here's the equation. The equation is X plus Y equals Z. It's real simple. X is gonna be your conductor. That's your X, all right? Whether it's energized or de-energized, doesn't matter. X is the conductor. Y plus Y. Y is your tool functionality. How the tool works, the why behind the tool. The how behind the tool, the what behind the tool. Tool functionality, why? This is how they work. Everybody's tool is the same. Don't forget that. They make contact with X, the conductor, plus Y, tool functionality. The tools couple with the capacitance. That's from that conductor. 
and the tool couples with the capacitance, the tools look at the current right here. The components inside look at the current in relation to the ground plane. And the tools give you a voltage indication. If your tool is corded, right here, it's still looking at the current in relation to the ground plane, but through the cord. So it's the same tool functionality, whether it's wireless or corded. Why? Tool functionality. So if it's looking at the current in relation to the ground plane, whether it's wireless or corded, then that, and it's giving you a voltage indication, what that's telling you is that the tool itself is energized. Not with the primary, because remember we have resistors. Maybe you're on a capacitive test point, all right? And we got, you're looking at a capacitive test point, corded or wireless, and then you got resistors. So whatever that capacitive test point has, what you're getting on the tool is just a percentage. It's just a chunk, right, of that power. Just a chunk, it's not the full but it's energized. Okay, equals Z. This is what the Z is always equal. You always thought it was what you're looking at as far as on the display, right? Information gathering. Everybody is, oh, okay, we're in phase. We're out of phase. Phase to ground reading, corded wireless. That's not what the Z equals, folks. The Z equals, check this out, safety, safety, and accurate information gathering. Not just information gathering, Safety and accurate information gathering, that's your Z. Got it? Simple. All right, so let's go over that. Any questions out there as of yet? Any questions, Jeremy? We're good? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna energize real quick. This trailer, we're back feeding the trailer with uh, 120, 208 and We're coming out the front of these pad mounts right here. We're gonna come out these hot bushings at uh, 19, 19.9, 34.5. We're gonna call this an overhead line, all right? We got three phase, we got capacitive test points. We got an overhead line, we'll call that 7200. It's not, but we'll call it that. And then we've got a, a three phase panel here, 120, 208, okay? So we're gonna go live. Now we're energized. And uh, if you all have any uh, safety conferences or anything like that, uh, you need field training, beer meters. Uh, we do field training. It's our pamphlet, safety conferences, speaking, whatever. Um, on site, at your location, you're gonna have to make some reservations though if you need it. Uh, this pamphlet tells you all of our services and this, none of our services cost you all a dime. It's just, we just give back. So this is not about selling any tools. It's just what we do. It's kind of cool. Being a family company, we can do whatever we want. We don't have stockholders to put money in their pockets. So what we do is we take a big chunk of our profits, about a million a year, and we give back to you all. Okay, that's what we do. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a meter here. And we've got, like I said, we've got some underground. We've, we have some pad mounts here with some capacitive test points. We got some overhead lines there. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna initially come to our work area and we're gonna do a test with the tool on a live known voltage source. This, this here at VD1000P, this, go, this does have a proximity setting. That's where the P comes from. I like to use this on the training. It's kind of cool. I like that, uh, the proximity setting. If you're out in the field, it's dark outside, you can't see very good, maybe it's storm restoration, or maybe you're just unsure of your environment, you wanna kinda of learn about it, what you can do, uh, or just approach a three-phase cabinet. Maybe you don't have capacitive test points, that's fine, you can go to the base of the elbow and the P setting will sniff out at the base of the elbow. If you got some overhead lines and you just wanna verify that those lines are energized or not, not necessarily regarding a particular phase, a particular conductor, but just to see if something up there is energized, you can just hold it up in the air. So we got, we have this tool in the P setting initially, and we're going to come into proximity. All right, Ben, you ready? You may have to get close for this. All right. And you can see this overhead line here. 
one of those phases at least is energized. All right, we're not making, initially we're not making direct contact or we're walking through a, 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 an alley, uh, a dark, um, a dark uh, scenario where it's real tight, a lot of bushes and, we're, and rain and we're just not sure where that conductor is. We got some lines on the ground, maybe they're hot. Maybe you guys are being called out to uh, help the fire department rescue somebody out of a vehicle, right? But the power has to be turned off. We'll start initially in the P setting. All right, we got the capacitive test points here. And you see that, Ben? So we can tell that the capacitive test points, those elbows are hot. Or we can go to the base of the elbow. I'll try to sh shield that sunshine. It's a warm sunshine. Okay, we'll go to the base of the elbow. Y'all see that? Okay, you can do that. But what we're going to do is we're always going to want to, uh, we always want to make direct contact with your tool. It's important to make, and we're going to talk about that in detail in a little bit as far as uh, non-contact voltage indicators and direct contact voltage indicators. It's so important that you guys understand the difference of the two. All right. So we're going to put this tool in URD, underground residential distribution. Our tools were the only manufacturer that discriminates whether the tool is far from the ground plane or close to the ground plane. Is the, and the reason why is, you know why, is because the tool's looking at the current, giving you a voltage indication in relation to the ground, okay? So we make sure that we, you're gonna let the tool know if you're working high or if you're working low. And you're gonna put it in the right setting, therefore it's gonna be more accurate for you in that scenario. So, we're going to put it in URD. We come to these capacitive test points, and you can see the numbers. See those numbers? They're not moving like they were last time. Direct contact. See that? About 1,000 about thousand volts, 800 volts. All right? So, when you're using this tool, direct contact, if, if, the, if that potential is below 1,000, it's not very accurate. But, it's direct contact. And you know that on that capacitive test point, you're energized. Now let's go ahead to this overhead line. All right, always use a proper accessory. You guys might've missed that. Straight probe, hook probe, bushing adapter. You can hear now, Jeremy? Okay, awesome. All right. I was at one utility back in April. And what they were using is on hot bushings, on feed throughs, what they had is they had a, a, a voltage indicator and their voltage indicator, when they were going on those hot bushings or those feed throughs, they were using a, an adapter on the end of their, on the end of their uh, tool. Uh, all it was, was that metal probe. It was not, there was no shielding. There was no cover up on the metal probe. And they were doing this for years. And I showed them our bushing adapter and it's like, man, you got to change that work method, ASAP and lickety split. And guess what? They did. All right. Thank goodness they never had an incident. So that's good. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this tool on this overhead line. It's close to the ground plane. We're going to go to URD. Make direct contact. Y'all see that? So we got about 20,000 volts direct contact. Now it's important that you use a direct contact tool. There is a lot of utilities, contractors, that their linemen use proximity tools. Mushroom, potato smasher, whatever you want to call it. And they're not direct contact. They, those tools there, because you're not using direct contact, they're influenced, obviously they're non-contact, they're influenced by the sources, the fields around them. So if you're using those non-contact tools on a conductor close in proximity and you are on an underbuild, you got this transmission line that, that that capacitance, that corona, a lot of those electrons are going down to the ground. A lot of those electrons, maybe it's in parallel with your distribution. A lot of those electrons are coming over and you've got You've got induction. They're coming over on that, that distribution line. 
and you got three conductors and you want to make sure that that one of them is de-energized at least before you set up your EPZ before you do some change out some work on it put new equipment up all right reconductor whatever and you want to make sure it's de-energized how in the heck can you use a non-contact tool and verify without a doubt that you don't have a false positive a false negative what's the voltage on your system is it dead or is it energized with non-contact tool how do you know no you don't know for sure but you become a good guesser you become skilled at being presumptuous you're a skilled presumer hmm? we don't want that here we want to make sure that our line our line workers they know that they know okay so always use direct contact. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna talk about something that happened recently. This is gonna be part of that psychological safety. An incident took place just yesterday. Some flaggers working for a contractor just yesterday. All right, you guys are gonna hear about all this. They were working for a contractor flagging, flagging uh, flagging the, uh, the traffic, making sure everything was safe. And what happened was, is somebody came by, it was hot out. I mean, look how hot it's been in the Southwest, right? Everywhere in the Southwest is just, it's hot here in the Southeast. Not as bad as back there though. At least we got water, we could jump in here. So what happened was, is somebody came by with some bottled water, gave those flaggers a bottle of water, had fentanyl in the bottle of water, one guy is dead today. The other guy's in critical condition. Keep him in prayer. Why did that happen? Why, why was there a need for that team to be disconnected? So, you know, when, when you guys play ball, whether it's basketball, whether it's football, um, whether it's soccer, these sports, You've got to control the ball. You know, everybody, everybody is looking at that goal. Everybody wants to see that ball going through the hoop. Everybody wants to see that guy carrying that ball across the end zone. Everybody wants to see that. But that's not the focus of the game. The focus of the game needs to be, and this is how a good team works, is to control the ball. That's it. Control the ball. And that's with line work. Line works exactly the same. Control the ball. And the ball represents your mind, your consciousness. We have to control the ball. Because your opponent, now think about this, your opponent. Okay, here's your opponent. You live in a world that if you look back 500 years, you look back 1,000 years, you look back 200 years. Everybody that's been birthed in this temporary thing called the body, which is not who you are, but everybody that's been birthed borrowing this dirt and water right this body the ground earth right here everybody has died everybody their body dies so you can very easily come to this knowledge that we live in a matrix of death okay that's just a fact and the truth the truth of the matter is that your opponent is death and if you don't control the ball Whoop, there goes an arm, there goes a finger, there goes a leg. Johnny's not going to be able to go home today. We're going to have to bring out the bucket trucks and do the flags and have a big procession because we got to put them in the ground. we got to put them in the ground, and the wife's going to be crying, the kids are going to be crying. And what, what did we learn from that? We go to root cause analysis. Well, you know, Johnny should have used more cover-up. Man, why did Johnny not test that conductor before he touched it? Why didn't Johnny have more line hose? Huh? Why didn't Johnny have a ground on that when the switch inadvertently became open downstream? Or not open, but closed downstream where it was supposed to stay open? <coughs> huh? Things happen. And when we're not a team, you know, when we're not a team, things happen. There is no way those flaggers should have taken that water. And, and there should have been a safety mechanism in place, a... a that house of safety where we all dwell in to where those guys did not need water from somebody else, a stranger that's not part of the team. 
Think about it. The opposition. Those the water bottles were were purposely uh, fentanyl was purposely placed in the water. Okay. See, so that other team, the opposition, can come to you as one of your own team members, a sheep. But inside that clothing is a wolf. Death. And that's what that was, death. And that shouldn't have happened. We've got to put in, we've got to put in a capacity of safety in, in with our line team. Because that person that came by was not part of the team. Even if somebody means well, that's great. Is the bottle sealed? I mean, I mean, think about these things. Are we going to watch over each other? The flagger is part of the team, just like the CEO. What difference is it that that journeyman lineman, all right, that's that that foreman that's on the ground watching the apprentice, huh? What difference is it if you're in that dwelling called safety, that house that you create from the foundation of the OSHA regs, all right, the rules? If you create a house that we all dwell in, the CEO is not going to be pious. The CEO is not going to be uh, making all, raking in all this money. And then in his mind, he's too good for his guys. Or in his mind, hey, he's got two months and he's going to retire. So he doesn't give a rip. He doesn't care about anybody in his line team. I have heard this. I've seen it. You know, you know what's freaky to me? Red flag. Red flag is I'll go to a uh, yard and do training. And the foreman, the operations manager... Whoever that's in there, they bring up this, and I never ask them. They just say, they say something like, "Hey, in three months, I am out of here. In three months, I'm retired, and I'm gonna go fishing. I'm gonna go play golf. I'm gonna ride my Harley." In three months, sometimes they tell me the days and the, how many hours. I am not kidding, and that to me is a red flag because their focus is all on themselves. 100%. There is no team in me. There is no team in myself. Okay? Y'all get that? All right. So what we need to do is, is whenever we're on a system, OSHA regs, if you go to number five of that 19, uh, 1910.269, go to number five, it tells you that you always gonna use your tester to verify that you're de-energized prior to installing your TPGs, your best friend. Always gonna use your tester, always. Always use your tester before making contact with that conductor. If you're on storm, you know one side is energized and you assume that other line over there, you're gonna splice it together. You, you assume that that other line is de-energized when you know this one is but you assume the other one is. How many apprentices, how many linemen have, have assumed that that conductor is de-energized and they grab a hold of that? Hmm? They grab a hold of that tail and didn't realize that, that there was a tiger on the other side, that that line had fire in it. Hmm? They get burned. They don't come home no more. Okay? So what you're going to do is we're always going to do, instead of open, test, ground, what we're going to do is we're going to do test, open, test, test the tester, ground, five steps every time. This, these five steps, what is really cool is after seven years, many, many utilities are changing their work practices and they're taking the regs, the rules, <clears throat> and they're adding two more steps. Instead of open test ground, they're adding two more steps. They're building the walls. They're building the, the roof. They're dwelling in that house called safety, and they're going above and beyond because they want to take care of their team. They want to control the ball, right? So they're going to add more, and they're going to test first. And they're going to, when testing first, one is we're going to verify the tools working on a live known voltage source. And when you're on that live known voltage source, let's say we're on 20,000 volts, if you're getting close to 20,000 volts, you're also confirming your tools calibrated. How often should you calibrate your tools? We say once a year as a manufacturer. Okay, that's our recommendation. But if your tool is calibrated for 20 years on all these sources, different sources, and it's pretty darn accurate, that means it's calibrated. But there's a third reason why we always test first. 
The third reason why is, is I want to verify that Mr. Jeremy, I want to verify that his head's in the game. And when we sign, when we sign that, that job brief, what we're going to do is we're going to sign two more lines. One line is that's going to be added to that job brief is that we are personally accountable to everybody on that crew at that job that day. We're personally accountable. In other words, we're fit for duty. In other words, check this out. We're going we're gonna to confess that we were not up late last night drinking with the boys and didn't get no sleep. We were prepared. We were fit for duty. We got a little good food. Eh, we drank a few beers, but we got a little bit of rest. So we're doing pretty decent. So we're fit for duty. But if you're out all night, I've heard these stories. If you're all out all night and you come to work that day and you're not fit for duty, you need to be taken back home. You don't need to be working with my team. Anybody can say this. An apprentice, if he sees the foreman that's not fit for duty, it should be safe for him to say to that person, you're not fit for duty. No retribution, no threats, but you're not fit for duty, man. Huh? You're falling asleep. You stink. You, you smell like alcohol. You're falling asleep in the truck while I'm driving because you can't drive. Huh? And you don't need to be on the job. Let's be honest with each other. And it should be safe to talk about this amongst us. And these incidences will start going away. They'll start disappearing. See how this works? So we're going to test first. The, others, the other line on that job brief is that we're going to sign is that we are mutually accountable. In other words, we're going to be watching out for each other, got each other's back the whole time we're on the, on the, at the job. Mutually accountable. Okay? So we're going to test first. Any questions? They can hear Jeremy? Yeah, no okay. And you guys could contact me afterwards if you have any questions. That's fine. So we're going to go URD again, direct contact. See, we got about 21,000 volts right there, a little over 20,000. So it's pretty close, pretty accurate. The grass is a little wet. We had a little rainstorm last night, so there's a little more moisture. So because of that, we know our environmental condition, it's not dry today, it's humid. We know that our reading is going to be on the high side. And guess what? The reading is on the high side, just like we assume. But you didn't assume, you knew because you know your electrical reality. So we always taught, you, you guys are, are, are taught knowledge. You go to a class and you're taught knowledge, a dry erase board, a PowerPoint, whatever, you're taught knowledge, but you need to know the why behind that knowledge. And if you don't know the why, you've got to ask. And it's got to be safe to ask. So ask the why. If you don't understand the why, after the first time you ask the question, ask again maybe they can rephrase for you say it a different way okay so maybe they can use some sort of an allegory an analogy all right a simple you know talk about growing crops or something to get the point across whatever it takes all right so we need to know why because knowledge plus understanding knowledge plus understanding equals safety if you do, if you can have all the knowledge in the world if you don't have understanding of that knowledge you just learned, then how do you know you're working safely? Okay? So what we're going to do is, not, so we verified that we have power. We verified the tools calibrated. Our heads are in the game. We talk about it. Ben, is your head in the game? Ben, you asked me. Is your head in the game? Yes, sir. You got my back? Okay. See, I don't even like Ben. He's behind the camera. I don't even like Ben, okay? He don't like me. I have piercing, I have, I have a bunch of tats, I use foul language a lot, so Ben don't like me, okay? But we're working together on this crew. We're a team. Regardless of if you like each other, when you become a lineman or an apprentice, CEO or flaggers, you guys have an oath to one another. You have an oath to watch out for one another. That's just your job. That is your job description, regardless of 
whether you like them or not. Okay? All right, then we're going to open the switch. Lock out, tag out. We have a confirmed open air gap. And then what we're going to do, step three, is we test. We test. We make contact with this overhead line, direct contact. All right? And the tool's telling us we're de-energized. All right? That's step three. Step four is we're going to use a either we got a power supply, 3 kV, or a handheld power supply, and we're going to test the tester. So test the tester is step four. You all see that? This verifies the tester was telling you the truth. All right? Test the tester. Now the fifth step, what we're going to do is, is we're going to go ahead and apply our grounds. You all get that? Real simple. Okay? So... Next thing we're going to talk about is arc flash mitigation. We're going to use a zero ohm extension. And this is arc flash prevention. Zero ohm extension. If you use those tools and you see as, as you inspect your area, maybe you're in a substation and you see that if you make contact with a particular phase, that there's going to be a, a hot bus nearby. And the idea is you don't want to have that hot bus inside that air dielectric, your best friend, okay? You don't want that. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna use a zero ohm extension. I was uh, on my way to do safety training for a utility in Texas last uh, January, last January, this past January. And on my way to do this training, <laughs> I, get, I get a call from, actually it was two, two years ago, Two Januarys ago, I get this call from the safety guy, and the safety guy calls me one day before I show up. He says, "Hey, man, we were using one of your tools, and we had an arc flash." And I said, "Well, what, what was going on?" Well, he's in the cabinet, and an amazing thing is, when he was in the cabinet, there was a bleed wire, static wire, next to the head of the meter, and he had an arc flash. He's fine. Everybody, everybody's fine. Didn't hurt. Didn't even hurt the tool. Um, and he took took a picture, and I said, "Man." I said, you should have waited one more day for him to use that tool. <laughs> and it was interesting. I got to meet that guy, that same lineman that had the arc flash and did the training. And he, he came up to me and spoke to me afterwards, thanking me. And th that was cool. But uh, post-incident training, I don't like to do that. I've done that. I've done post-incident training uh, after an incident, a a after a fatality. Several times I get to a utility and I do this lineman safety and tool training and it was sometimes weeks. One time it was days after a fatality. That is not fun. You can feel the pain from these guys. That vibration and frequency. You can feel their hearts, man. That, that hurt. You can feel it. It's horrible. It's not fun. But So we got a zero ohm extension now. So let's take another reading. Let's throw that switch in real quick. Take another reading. And you all see that number? About 20,000 volts. That's just about true RMS voltage, folks. That right there, that's like using a recorded tool that actually does give true RMS voltage. That's how accurate that is now. So with the zero ohm extension, what two things have taken place physically with your electrical reality, okay? Prior to using the zero ohm to now we have the zero ohm, two things have taken place. What are they? Anybody say anything, Jeremy? Two things have happened physically. I'll give you guys a clue, okay? One thing is, we are further from the source. Huh? Remember how the tools work? Remember, they make contact with the conductor. The tool couples with the capacitance, looks at the current in relation to the ground plane, right? So now we're further from the source. So the tool's more accurate. Remember, it's a hot, humid day today. We had rain. So it's going to read high. Now it reads more accurate. Make sense? And we're further from the ground plane. Those two things, physically, that's what you see. That's your electrical reality. Okay. Now, doing training, 
in Tennessee several years ago and there was a arc flash. Two guys were working a cabinet. One guy, one guy was on the stick working the cabinet and he had his air dielectric working them elbows. The cabinet was loose from the foundation. The other guy took his gloved hand. He went to the cabinet to help steady the cabinet. And when he put his gloved hand on that cabinet, he was arc flashed. Spent a little time, got in the hospital, didn't lose no body parts. He lives, he's fine, he's working today. All right, but he used his glove. And what happened was one guy kept his best friend, air dielectric. See that air gap between me and that energized tool? See that? Kept his air dielectric. The other guy, he trusted a good friend, his glove. He trusted a good friend. These are not best friends. You, do, you cannot rely on PPE to protect you. If you rely on these to protect you and not this, your safety and your training to protect you, you're in bad shape, all right? And he, tr he trusted a good friend and that, that potential bypassed his good friend, tracking went straight to dirt and water, earth. Those electrons, when they started seeing him, earth, getting close, they got all excited and they're loosely bound and they found him and he got arc flashed, okay? So, keep your air dielectric. Now check this out. Okay, Ben, you're gonna wanna come in close. So here we go. You guys see those numbers right there? You guys see those numbers? Now watch what happens. I've got gloves on. Watch what happens to those numbers, okay? Watch what happens. As I approach with gloves on, what's happening? Hmm? Those numbers going up? They're going up, aren't they? They're going up because those electrons, which are there, that's your electrical reality. If you're in a bucket truck and you're near an energized source, that's exactly what's happening. They're connecting with your body. They're coupling with your body to some measurable degree. They are, that's, what, that's how it works, period. So as, you, as I approach that tool, those electrons go up. So remember to always keep that air dielectric. So you never want to use your tool by short sticking, right here, short sticking. And you don't want to use this tool ever with your gloved hand. Some folks think this is safe. Remember that equation, X plus Y. X plus Y equals safety and accurate information gathering. This has never been safety or accurate information gathering. And the reason why is because when you, when you short stick or you tool glove, what happens is it's X plus Y plus U equals unsafe and unaccurate information gathering. It's never been safe, ever. Had one gentleman, about a 25 year journeyman lineman, California. He was tool gloving. No one ever taught him any different. No one ever taught him nothing regarding how the tools function. Anybody's tools. And what he did is he went to that capacitive test point barehanded with his tool. All right? So you know how these tools work. And you know what he told me what happened. He got popped. And you guys knew that would happen. He didn't know. He was tool gloving. And for his entire career, he was tool gloving, and this one time, one time, he used his tool without his gloves on. See what happens? He was doing, completing an unsafe practice for years, and then he took that unsafe practice to the next level, and there was an incident, okay? I wanna to talk to you guys about incidents real quick. Real quick, then Mr. Ryan Beerer, my nephew, is gonna come and help me out. So, this last uh, winter, I went through uh, with the trailer, doing training throughout uh, Texas and in Arizona and California, and then back to Georgia Power. But anyways, when I was there, I went to a uh, utility called Trico Electric Cooperative, Marana out of Tucson. And Mr. John was having me come in and doing the training, and uh, it was really cool. It was a beautiful uh, morning, upper Sonoran Desert. Nice and cool, about 32 degrees. You could smell the desert, the flora. 
in that cold desert air, which is really dry, and it's, it's just beautiful, actually. And anyways, he told me before I start, he wanted me to just hold on for 15 minutes. And what Trico did is they had a tailboard. And I like, I like being involved and in being a part of things that utilities and contractors do, just so I watch and learn how they're doing their method, how they build their, their house of safety above the normal rules. Because this isn't in the rule book. It's not in the rule book to sit down and just talk about incidences that took place the week previously. Not in the rule book, but they do it. And the reason why they do it is they're encouraging communication. They're, they encourage team, Trico Electric Cooperative. And man, when they started, there's two guys, two incidences that took place that these guys freely shared. And when they freely shared these two incidences, it just warmed my heart because nobody was put down. Nobody was made fun of. Nobody ha had uh, their pay docked. Nobody had an infraction on their job. Nobody. They were. We all make mistakes, and they know it, and they all talked about these mistakes. And the reason why we need to talk about these incidences, close calls, near misses, the reason why we need to talk about them is because if we don't, we never learn. We never learn. That incident that took place in Tennessee, the guy got arc flash. He, got, he put his gloved hand on that cabinet. They never discussed it. They never talked about it. And the reason why is because they said the, 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 the root cause analysis, the, the report said that he, he got arc flash because of rat piss in the cables. Close the book, give him a little money for time off work, pay the hospital bills, and we're, we, we, we're back to work. But there was no knowledge shared. There was no understanding. And so if there's no knowledge and understanding, how do you get equal safety? You don't. We don't learn from our mistakes. And every day, every one of you guys and me, all of us, ladies, we all make mistakes. That's how it is. But the only way we're going to come out of this, this, this normalcy bias that we have these days of, eh, we, eh, let's just do a root cause and talk about these physical things. Well, where was your mind? Maybe the root cause is actually right up here. But we blame things so we don't get blamed. We blame things, rat piss, we blame rat piss so that the foreman on the job or, or the job briefing, you know, or the understanding on how electricity works, everybody get, is escape. Everybody escapes the blame game. And it's not, when we talk about it, we're not playing blame game. What we want to do is talk about it. And we're all equal. We're all equal. The flaggers, the CEO, foreman, everybody's equal. Okay? We need to share. All right? So you ready, Mr. Ryan? Okay, you can tell them what you're gonna do, what tool you're gonna use and everything. We're gonna use our PD25. That's our corded voltage, uh, voltmeter slash uh, phasing meter. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use it to take some readings across Brent's body using the tool improperly versus properly. Uh, and you'll get to see the difference. You'll get to see the difference across his glove on his wet shirt from him sweating, and then also on his boot that we consider an insulating uh, form of PPE. I'm gonna take the tool, put it in the 2KV setting. I've got the second probe over here attached to the trailer going to ground. That's gonna be our ground reference. First, we'll take some readings real quick using the tool properly, staying back on your stick. Come on, and we'll get to see the difference. So here, already, just using the tool properly, his body's being induced about 115 volts. His shirt here, we can see about 130 volts, 129 volts. And then we'll go to his gloved hand, which as you guys know, would be considered insulating. Still, we see about 17 volts. That's that capacitive charge that he's being uh, induced with his body. Now we'll take the same readings showing using the, the tool improperly. This would be your short stick. So encroaching on your minimum approach distance, whatever that may be. 
Now we see the difference already about 236, 200, we'll just say 240 volts here on his body. Now we see about 270 volts. So quite a big difference there. And then again on his gloved hand, now we see about 50 volts. So 50 volts and this particular scenario, you could take it and it could be more or less depending on your particular scenario, whether or not you're, you're using the tool very unsafe versus you're doing one thing wrong, short sticking, or you know many other variables that could take place out in the field. Yeah, so Brent went and made a change out here. He's got some overshoes. So these overshoes were generously donated by a utility. They wanted to know if we performed the same test that we just went through using overshoes as a form of PPE, if those numbers would change or if they would stay the same. They were betting that the numbers would stay the same and Brent told them well, if it would the, be lower. Yeah, would, or the numbers would be lower. Brent said if they stay the same, can we make a deal? Can I get your overshoes for any further training? So as you see, he's got the overshoes so we can kind of we can kind of guess what we'll expect to see here. We'll run through that same scenario again, using it safely. Go to the rubber bank. There you go. The rubber itself, we see a difference of only 11 volts. As soon as we go to his foot, even though he's got the, the overshoes on, we already see that same voltage, about 150 volts. Go to his body again, about 160 volts. And then even on his gloved hand up here, about 30 volts again. So pretty much the same. Okay, so you all see how electricity works? When you're working safe, working unsafe. Electricity, your, re your electrical reality does not change. So when you're working safe, what happens is you know that your electrical reality doesn't change, but you need to change right here. You need to change. So in other words, you're going to use PPE. In other words, you're going to use and follow minimum approach distance. In other words, you're not taking shortcuts. In other words, whatever those regs say, you're going to follow all the time, every time, whether the safety guy is looking or whether you're on the job with an apprentice alone. We don't take shortcuts. We don't do it any differently than what we train for. Whatever you train for, that's what you do all the time you stay consistent. And the reason why you stay consistent is because you got to control the ball. You've got to control the ball. You are playing the game. And those folks in the stands that are watching you play the game, that's called your family. That's called your kids, your wife, your loved ones, all right, your husband, whatever. They're watching you. Yeah, they're not with you, but they're watching you come home. They're watching you bring in the bread. They're watching you happy. They're watching you because you feel good about yourself because your line team back at the back at the shop, every one of them is safe all the time. You're working safely and you have that in your heart. You know they are in your mind. And and we're not taking that one shortcut. We're not doing this one job just a little quicker because hey, we're running out of time. Hey, we're hungry. Hey, the sun's going down. Hey, we're going to just do it this way this one time. There's no, there's no substitute for safety. You all see that? There's no substitute. Okay? Okay, Ryan. Let's, uh, let's do some phasing. Okay. You want to We're going to use this we'll first? Over here. All right. And you can talk them through. Yeah. So now we'll use the same tool, that PD25, the corded voltmeter slash phasing meter. And I'll demonstrate using it to phase. Uh, this is gonna be tool specific. So unlike some of the safety that Brent's talked about prior, this uh, function is gonna be pretty specific to this tool and this tool only, just because of the, the safety and the, the functionality of this tool. So Using it's gonna be a little bit different from traditional phasing. Uh, with the accuracy of this tool, we can use it to phase on the capacitive test points. Capacitive phasing on, let's say, an analog tool, you know, you, you put it in a capacitive phase setting. 
and if you're in phase you get no deflection of the needle if you are out of phase you get a strong deflection of the needle this tool with it being as accurate as it is as as good as uh, the job that it does as it is it's going to be able to pick up the differences between each elbow and what I mean by that are the different, the very, very slight differences between the resistive values of each elbow if you've got capacitive test points. So each one of these elbows, although they're from the same manufacturer, they may have a different resistive value. Although they went through the same processes, maybe one's a little bit older than the other. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take phase to ground measurements. The reason we're going to do that, a couple different reasons is we're going to verify first that the tool's working and that what we are testing is energized. Then the second reason is going to be because you're going to need that information later on. So also we're verifying that our head's in the game like Brent spoke about earlier. So there's actually three reasons. So we're, like I said we're going to want to remember these numbers. So on the first elbow the capacitive test point we see about 129 volts 130 volts we're going to go to the next one and we're going to take that reading and we see about 127 volts so the reason it's important to remember those numbers is for one if you're in phase the number is going to be that difference that you're going to see not zero so like with your uh, traditional phasing meters you would see zero if you're in phase this device is going to actually show you that difference so we saw about three volts difference two volts difference so when we go phase to phase we should expect to see that number so we get that number close to zero we see one volt so we know we're in phase if we we're out of phase instead of being close to zero like that the number would be uh, that 1.72 multiplier out of phase. So you would see like somewhere around 350, 370 volts. Okay, let's go to this panel, Brian. Let us, let us know if you have any questions about that in the comments as well. We can go further into our explanation. Okay. Now we'll, we'll use the tool. This tool has an auto timeout feature, so we've been using it for a while. We're going to have to turn it back on here, put it in the 2KV setting, so it just timed out, just so the battery doesn't drain. Go ahead and that load. First, right. first, what's that here? That one. The B. Yeah, okay. So first we'll go phase to ground here, using it on our secondary panel. We see about 121 volts. Stay there. Oh. Then he'll go to the other side and we see zero or right at zero usually so we know we're in phase here and then next we'll go phase to phase out of phase and we see about 209 volts so 12208 panel we see about 208 volts phase to phase okay let's phase this so yeah we're gonna phase this overhead line so next we'll use the same tool and we'll use it to phase here and our primary bushings. So that overhead line looks like it has some hot bushings, which is highly unusual. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our use our bushing adapters on that overhead line. And notice how when Ryan and I make this change, equipment change, accessory change, maybe you got to change uh, positioning your your bucket truck. Maybe you got to change equipment, tooling, whatever whatever change you got to. Maybe you're in South Carolina on a hot summer day and it's sweaty and your britches need to be changed. So what you're going to do is you're going to get away from that potential. You're going to get away from how you know your electrical reality works and you make the change. Y'all get that? Doing this on a consistent basis, what you're doing is you're dwelling in that house of safety. You're controlling the ball. You're not allowing your opponent death, harm, injury, loss. All right? You're not allowing your opponent to have any time with the ball. You're controlling the ball the whole time. Offense, defense, you got the ball. It's your ball. It's your mind. You watch out over each other. Watch out for each other for that, okay? 
Okay, go ahead, Ryan. So same thing as last time, using it on the primary, we're gonna go phase to ground first for the same couple reasons, testing the tool as well as preparing yourself, uh, making sure your, your head's in the game here. That cord. So we get a one, so maybe our head's not quite in the game like we thought it was. We left it in the 2KV setting. So I'm just gonna come to the back here, put it in our 25 KV setting, and we should start getting some better information. So we see about 20.5 KV. So again, it shows the accuracy of that other tool, that VD-1000, when we were using it with that zero ohm extension earlier. So now we'll go phase to phase. We'll see if we're in phase here. And we see we're very close to zero. We see about 0.3. Uh, there's a chance you may get uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 some days when the ground's wet. Especially if the cable's laying on the ground, you can actually hear that little bit of buzzing going on. It's about a half a milliamp of current or less flowing through this cable. So it is pretty safe, but you can still hear that minor bit of current flowing through that cable. So that's just the bleed to ground off that cable that you see there. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. When you're done high potting, you're done phasing, you're completed the task. What you're going to do is you're going to de-energize the tool. All right? And you're always going to do it in this sequence. You don't have to do it in this sequence. You all are training your linemen to do it in this sequence because you understand your electrical reality. And you want the tool to speak with, with you and talk with you and let you know when it's de-energized. So every time you're going to take that secondary probe, whoever's tools it is, don't matter, you're going to take that secondary probe to ground first. Okay, and then Ryan, you take it from here. So we'll do that secondary probe to ground. And like Brent said, whether you're just high potting or phasing, if you're high potting especially, you'll see those numbers start to bleed off immediately. And however long it took you to charge the cable, you wanna wait that time and make sure that that reading is zero to verify that all that charge or that, that, uh, that capacitance that was built up gets bled off to ground. So you see those numbers take a minute to bleed down to zero. Just takes a minute just because of the resistance in these probes that we put in these tools. Okay. So now something, something to always keep in mind. We are the only manufacturer that builds safety into our cord. What we do, and no one else does this, what we do is we have a cord that conducts that phase to ground, that current, and looks at the voltage, gives you a voltage reading to ground, we have that cord that does that, that corded tool that does it in the cord. We have it shielded. No one else does this. This cord is shielded at 35,000 volts. So when you use our tool, you can use it with the cord on the ground. It's safe. You can use this tool with the cord laying over a box as you go from one phase on that cabinet to the other side of the cabinet to another phase. You can use that cord on the box or a box on the ground, a lid or whatever. So it's very safe. We put extra safety in the tools. All right. Um, we're we're going to show you guys real quick how to phase wirelessly. It's efficient. It's extremely safe and quick. Ryan, you want to go ahead and explain to him? Yeah. So if you look over here at our tower, we're gonna have our, our reference probe on what we, we call a known A phase. So that known A phase is gonna be our reference here for a minute. What we could do later on is if we don't have a known A phase, but maybe one of the other two are identified and you wanna verify to make sure nothing's been rolled, you can use your other known phase. So maybe it's B, C, X, Y, Z, whatever you guys wanna call it. But here we're gonna, we're gonna use our A phase reference. That. Oh, I'm just going to turn it on. So, turning the tool on, we want to first verify and make sure that both tools are in the same position. Since we're just going to go over phasing with this tool, we're going to just use the tool in the degree setting. 
So the degree setting, this tool does not any longer care about voltage, the potential that you're using it on. It's just going to be looking at that uh, 0, 120, and 240 crossing or, uh, that you would get if you think of like a generator, 0, 120 degrees out, and then 240 degrees out. So here, our known, our known phase that we're, that we're using is going to be our 0, and then the other two, say, we, like again, we're verifying a roll or to see if something's been rolled or we're verifying that phasing, maybe the tape or uh, any nomenclature is correct. This is going to be our reference. So this is going to be A. If you notice when we hook it on here, we get a white light verifying that what you're making contact with is energized. And you can think about that as on this tool, this probe, when you get a white light, you've got a match. So you're in phase, no matter what the, the, that phase is called. When you see a white light and it's close to zero, you know that you're in phase. So I'll demonstrate that here real quick. Using it on these capacitive test points. What we got going on here? It's rolled. Oh. Yeah. So we verified here with our, our lights and our numbers that what we thought was our A here is not in fact our A, it's been rolled. And I guess, is that on purpose? Yeah. It is? Yep. All right. So this isn't our A phase here. Somewhere between that overhead line and our underground pad mount here, that, that, that conductor has been rolled and it's been labeled incorrectly previously. So we'll go here, test this single face pad mount, and we get 120 degrees. So B is in fact labeled correctly since A is our reference and our sequence is A, B, C. We get a blue light and 120 degrees. 120 degrees would be following whatever our reference is being A. So we know B is correct. So we'll come down here. We already have a pretty good idea that this is probably going to be our A. It's probably been rolled. And it is. We see close to zero, 350. So 350 or 360 in a circle is the same as zero. So when you're talking about angles, zero and 360 degrees are the exact same. So we get a lagging angle of 350 degrees and a white light. So we verified that just because that transformer says C, it's not in fact C, this is actually A, and somewhere between these two points it's been rolled. All right, so that's, that's your phasing wirelessly. Um, thank you, Brian, yeah, appreciate it. Um, if our reference was B, if our reference was B, the sequence that we're looking for now would be B, C, A. B, 0, C, 120. A would be your 240. Now, we know that A and C here are actually rolled. That our C is over there, our A is over here. So we know our rotation is not clockwise, it's counterclockwise. All right, now remember, working with the corded tool, Always remember that this cord is part of the tool, so we recommend to stay 36 inches away from your, your device. Create that air dielectric. We recommend 36 inches. That means you stay in 36 inches away from the cord as well on your corded device. Whosoever it is, stay away from that cord. We had an incident in Texas a couple years back, and what happened was is there was two guys in a substation, and they were working the substation. And what they did is they went to that, that, that hot bus. They went to that hot phase, made contact with the corded tool. And they weren't ever trained on how their tools work. They weren't trained on the functionality of their tools. They just got a new tool set, phasing set, corded, wireless, who cares. They were given that set and they were just said, hey, here's your task for today, go to work. Brand new set. But they never tr were trained in their history and they weren't training on how the tools function. They do now. So we don't get these calls from them, obviously. When they made contact with that hot phase, 
that meter head, which is energized from the hot phase, was in close proximity to a full potential hot bus in that substation. And they did, remember they bypassed that, that resistor, and they did experience an arc flash. That full potential, guys, all right? Um, and that shot down the cord, it went to the secondary probe, blew up there, blew up here, and the cord in between was all fried up and mangled and blackened in different pieces, all right? But those two linemen, when I showed up to give them that lineman safety and tool training, those two linemen were able to tell me their story. Thank goodness, that incident that took place. And the reason why is because they did train their linemen, and this is good, to stay 36 inches away from the cord. <clears throat> so when that arc flash took place, they had their they had this their minimum approach distance from their tool basically what we recommend 36 inches they kept that they had their air dielectric they were safe all right y'all get that so important we had a situation uh a few decades ago in a little town uh don't even want to say where but in a little town a few decades ago in a substation they were working on 69,000, and when they were working on 69,000 volts what happened was there's a brand new foreman that came in. There was a guy that was working in this territory, this area for a long time with a brand new foreman. And what they did is they, they hit the switch and the switch opened and the conductor that they were gonna work on, they assumed it was de-energized. Now, now think about this. They saw the switch open, they saw the light come on and they, they, they assumed that that conductor they were gonna work on was de-energized. And what happened was, is they did not test the conductor. They just assumed that that switch, when it opened, that that conductor was de-energized. And what they did, now listen to this. So that's, that's one mistake. That's one, that's one serious practice that was a shortcut that you just don't do that. They're, and what they did is, they came out of that house of safety at, at this job site. The new foreman, didn't say anything of it. The new foreman didn't care about testing it because they didn't do it. He didn't say nothing. No one said anything. They didn't test it to verify at all. And what happened is the other thing they did is they were gonna ground that phase. And what they did is they took their, their, their ground, their assembly, TPG assembly, and they took that clamp. Now think about this. They took the clamp that was on the hot stick and they went to that conductor, threw it on that conductor first. They never did take that other side of their TPG and they go to earth first, secure it to earth first. They didn't do that first. All right. So another shortcut. The foreman didn't say nothing. The guy doing the job didn't say anything. And when he made contact with that conductor at that substation, and because the other end of the TPG was not to earth, not grounded to earth, securely fashioned to earth, what happened was is that assembly started whipping around. And that assembly, which is now energized, with the full potential, was whipping around, smacked him, smacked him in the leg. Permanent disability, he survived. Permanent disability the rest of his life. Never had to happen. Completely 100% preventable. Okay? So you all need to remember, we do not take any shortcuts. All right? I want to share another story. And this is what's happening in our industry. And it's really the, 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 the uh, cat catastrophes as far as the incidents, the death, losing body parts. It has flatlined since 2008. 2008, almost 20 years now, no change. And the reason why it hasn't changed is because right up here, the root cause analysis, almost 100% of these incidences are completely predictable, quantifiable, and preventable and that's a fact osha proved it back in 2004 they proved it and nothing has really changed so several several uh years ago there was a lineman and he just he just topped out just became he just left the apprenticeship and he is officially a lineman okay and he just got another pay raise he's happy he just got married just got married brand new wife they're gonna have a great family he's making the money and guess what he was working a job foreman's on the ground 
He's in the bucket truck. He's working a job. It's at the end of the day, he's hot, he's tired, he's thirsty, and he's thinking about, wait a minute, he's thinking about something other than line work. And from one, in one split second, he was at the top of his game. And he was thinking about other so things besides team. He was thinking about other things besides the guy on the ground. Was the guy on the ground watching him? Was he watching his uh, situation? Was he looking at all his equipment, at his distances, his body, his body positioning? Was he? He's working hot. And, that, and when you've got fire in the wire, that fire is your enemy. And it always needs to be considered your enemy. Now, why would you have your shoulder rubbing up against your enemy? Hey, bud, how is it going today? Why would you do that? Always never put your back to the enemy. And for just a split second, he had his back to the enemy. He went from here to here in a split second. So you all need to watch out for each other at all times. You're not going to be on the social media. You're not going to be focusing on things that have nothing to do with your team. You got to always stay mentally focusing on not just what you're doing, but always watching out for your fellow line worker. Always. All right. Appreciate you all being here and uh, spread the word of eCause. We got some wonderful speakers and videos that you all can have no cost. And uh, enjoy your day. Drink lots of water. Know where you're drinking it from. Bye-bye.